Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you with This Week in Prophecy. This Week in Prophecy, we're looking at events from approximately the 11th of August, the second week of August, 2020. This Week in Prophecy, we look at, as we often do, events happening in Israel at the moment. As has been reported in the secular media, the balloon attacks carrying incendiary devices have been relaunched once again by Hamas. This time they've done significant damage to agricultural produce, destroying crops, destroying essentially um, vegetable produce, and terrorizing the people who live in the area to the south and south uh, east of Tel Aviv. This has been quite a problem such a problem that the Israeli Air Force responded and the Israeli ground forces, the IDF, responded with tank fire. This also has caused the Israelis to close the border at uh, Kerem Shalom. They will allow in medical supplies and humanitarian aid only. Food supplies, the Israelis do not want to bring about a siege causing starvation for people who may not be part of the exploits of Hamas, but Hamas has been on the warpath, and the Israelis have responded. At the same time this has happened, what's unreported generally in the events is secret meetings that took place between the Qatar emissary in Gaza, Mohammed al-Arabi, and the director of the Israeli Mossad intelligence, Yossi Cohen. The Israelis are hoping to use Qatar to neutralize the violence taking place in Gaza at the moment under the hand of Hamas. Qatar is a player that tries to play all sides. It gets in bed with the West, it gets in bed with the Israelis, it gets in bed with the Turks, it gets in bed with anyone. Uh, it's not a country to be trusted, but it is a country that different people use for different purposes. It is not a country that acts in a concert with the other Emirates, and of course there are tremendous tensions between Qatar and the Saudi Arabians to the point that the Saudi Arabians affected a blockade against Qatar, which was essentially broken by Turkey. Watch for Qatar to become more of a player in the Middle East and in Gaza, not because of Qatar, but because of the other forces who use it. Let's continue. The border situation along the Gaza Strip remains very tense. There's a lull at the moment, but these balloons can be relaunched very quickly, and the Israelis undoubtedly have made it clear they intend to respond. Such is happening this week in prophecy. The major news of the Middle East, however, continues to be the aftermath of the explosions in Beirut. As yet, no blame has firmly been apportioned to anyone. The popular belief, at least the popular claim being 
put across in the mainstream media and in Lebanese media is that it was an accident as a result of the storage of highly combustible material on a ship in the port area adjacent to the airport. It is unbelievable that upwards of 300,000 people were left homeless, over 600 injured, most of them seriously, and the death toll is now approximately 157, but more dead bodies may be found and recovered from the rubble. It's still unknown as to a final death toll. Benjamin Netanyahu, Russia Memshala, Prime Minister of Israel, has been in talks with President Macron of France. Now, Macron is not the biggest supporter of Israel, neither is he a particularly good friend of the United States or Britain. He's simply a left-wing socialist bureaucrat, more or less. Nonetheless, France was the colonial power in Lebanon. It was France who structured Lebanon and Syria, separating Lebanon from Syria and creating it where there would be some kind of a coalition between Maronite Christians, Druzes, and mainly Sunni Muslims. But then the Shia Muslims aligned to Iran came into play, headed by Sheikh Nasrallah, who was essentially a close ally of the mullahs in Iran. What is taking place this week is political turmoil and instability. The government of Hassan Diab has essentially all but fallen. It is scarcely functional amidst protests. The protests concern the culture of corruption and corruptocracy that has prevailed under his leadership and has prevailed in the country generally following the assassination by former leader Mr. Hariri, which was undoubtedly orchestrated by Syria, Iran, and Hezbollah. Be that as it may, an unexpected voice has emerged out of the rubble. By the rubble, I do not simply refer to the aftermath of the bombing itself and the debris, but the political rubble that is taking place. President Michael Arun is being faulted wildly, as is Hezbollah and its leader, Nasrallah. Nasrallah was actually protested for the first time on a large scale inside of Lebanon by various factions of the society, blaming Hezbollah for the explosion, which, of course, he has denied. He has said it was not a Hezbollah arms dump or a secret arms warehouse that is contended and disputed. The Israelis or the Americans have not addressed whether they believe it was or it wasn't, but it is popularly believed by many people inside of Lebanon. And it has placed Nasrallah and Hezbollah in a precarious position, along with the chief of state, President Michael Arun, who is now 80 years old. The real long-term prospects for a recovery in Iran will come from the oil-rich Gulf states. It will come from them. It will not come from France. It will not come from the West. It will not come anymore from Iran, other partners such as Syria. It'll come essentially from the money that's in the Gulf. But the Gulf states are waiting. They're waiting to look for a political stability. Certain things are taking place in Lebanon that would have been unthinkable at one time, but they're actually transpiring now. One of which is the Gulf states are tacitly on terms of dialogue with the Israelis based on mutual interest concerning Iran and the Iranian threat and Iranian control over Hezbollah. Hence, you have not an alliance of convenience or even a friendship of convenience, but you have a cooperation of convenience between Israel, the Gulf states, and even Saudi Arabia and with certain factions inside of Syria and Iraq. Nonetheless, that is what's happening. The second thing that's happening that is essentially unprecedented is the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, the patriarch, Bekari Butrus Alirai, sorry, Bekar Butros Alirai, 
the leader of the Maronite Catholic Church. The Maronites are an Eastern Rite of the Roman Catholic Church. They're under the papacy, but they follow the rituals in Greek language and so forth of the Byzantine Church. They are not the Latin Rite or the Western Rite of Roman Catholicism, but they are under the papacy, under the Roman Catholic Church. This goes back to the time of the Crusades. Be that as it may, their leader, the patriarch, patriarch, sort of an archbishop, Bakari Butrus Avrai, has called for the government and the cabinet to resign. Now, this is major political interventionism by the Roman Catholic Church, and it has the implicit support of the Gulf states. To see Islamic states agreeing with nominal Christians, and to see the Gulf states cooperating with Israel does show that there is a major, major shift taking place in the geopolitics of the Middle East, and Lebanon has brought this to the forefront. What we also see taking place in Lebanon is the following. There has been a buildup of Israeli troops on the northern border of Israel along the border with southern Lebanon to repulse any advances by Hezbollah. Desperate people do desperate things, and Hezbollah's position is becoming desperate. Russia is not as friendly to Iran as it once was. The Israelis have stepped up their opposition to the Iranians, as have the United States. And Iran itself is now seeing attacks on its own territory that it denounces as terrorism. This week in prophecy, those attacks continued, even on ships, marine assaults, on Iranian flagged ships in the Persian Gulf. That is the first time this has happened, involving a total of seven ships, as well as other mysterious fires and explosions taking place inside Iran. The Iranians announced this week that the centrifuge technology needed for uranium enrichment was so significantly damaged by the explosion and aftermath fires that it may be irretrievable or irreparable. There are major setbacks in Iranian development. Nonetheless, the Iranians have pushed back with weapons testing, testing missiles launched from underground silos for the first time on a mock attack of a U.S. aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. Again, Iran is not in the best of all positions. The Iranian guards have real control, not the Iranian military. And following the American elimination, assassination of their military commander in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon, who was generally in charge, they remain in a very unstable state. They do a lot of saber rattling, but this saber rattling is essentially there for public relations. It's not there to scare the West or even to scare the Gulf states. It's there to impress its own people at a time of growing economic crisis. The economic crisis in Iran is far worse than most people realize. It is not quite a Venezuela but if something doesn't change within the next year, it will begin heading very much in that direction. In fact, on paper, it's already heading in that direction, that Iran will become the Venezuela of the Middle East, an oil-rich country where its oil wealth means nothing, isolated from its neighbors. It is losing part of its grip in Syria. It is losing much of its grip in Lebanon. It may play the Islamic nationalism card of becoming aggressive towards Israel, but Israel is in no mood, as we've seen in Israeli responses to all Iranian-backed activity and Hezbollah activity inside Syria. But the Israelis have increased, certainly, commando units and other counterinsurgency forces, both in the Golan and along the Lebanese border. This week in prophecy, Camilla Harris was appointed by Joseph Biden to be 
the vice presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. Uh, it is interesting that this is the first time out and out where someone was appointed on the basis not of qualification or experience, but on the basis of race and gender. Uh, the Democratic Party must play the race card and the gender card to try to unite itself while it is divided against itself between the strong left of the Bernie Sanders followers that it is being forced to pander to and the left of center mainstream party of Joseph Biden, the Clintons, and to a degree, Barack Obama. Camila Harris is somebody who was in the left center camp, but because she is black and a woman, it is Biden's hope that she will be able to pacify or placate the Antifa, the Black Lives Matter, and the extreme left faction of the quartet of Alexandra Ortez Cortega and of Congresswoman Omar and Congresswoman Kliab and Congresswoman Presley. What you have here, of course, is the Congresswoman from Gaza, the Congresswoman from Mogadishu, and you have <laughs> the Congresswoman from Venezuela pushing the Democratic Party progressively to the left. It has become out of control for the last two months plus in cities and states controlled by the Democratic Party. As the murder rates increase, police budgets are being slashed by the mayor of New York City, de Blasio. In Seattle, the police budget is being cut in half as crime is soaring beyond previous levels. It's almost unbelievable what is happening. The Democratic Party, as we've said, is having a civil war between its radical left and its left center. The hope is Camila Harris will be able to bring some stability to the party. The only basis of unity that the party has had is to pander to the extreme left, as Mr. Biden is doing, and to try to make Mr. Trump the common enemy, blaming him for things that had nothing to do with him or to do with his administration or to do with the Republican Party, such as what transpired in Minneapolis and elsewhere. Yet the blame goes to Mr. Trump for problems that were caused by Democrat politicians in Democrat-controlled cities and states. This is the name of the game, and of course the left-wing media is very happy to promote this false narrative, knowing well it's false. Camila Harris was the former Attorney General of California. She was rejected flatly as a presidential candidate in the nomination process for the primaries of the Democratic Party. She was rejected flatly at a very early point. But she is there. Now, what is interesting about her is that she is married to a left-wing Jew. She is married to a left-wing Jew, and she is less hostile to Israel than the quartet. I'm not saying she's a friend of Israel. She is not, but she is less hostile. Right now, we have a situation brewing in the United States that can only have ramifications for Israel. The best thing that will happen for Israel, of course, is the re-election of Donald Trump who has, among other things, a number of evangelicals in his administration, on his staff, and in his cabinet, who, for theological as well as political reasons, are sympathetic to Israel. This includes Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Mr. Trump's personal lawyer, Jay Sekulow, and, of course, Vice President Pence, this week in Prophecy. This week in Prophecy at the Bioinstitute of Messiaen in Israel. The first Corona-19 vaccine is ready for human testing. It may be the first one in the world that actually comes to being tested on humans. It is partly fueled by an Israeli desperation to control the virus inside Israel because it has had such traumatic political ramifications for the coalition government between Likud and Kohova Levan. Mr. Gantz, who is having surgery on his back this week, and Benjamin Netanyahu. 
the electoral situation in Israel is so precarious that the present coalition of necessity may break down in November if there are not unforeseen developments. However, it would have broken down already had there not been a move to compromise on both the budget and Corona-19. Additionally, the threats from Hezbollah, Hamas, and Iran are forging a sense of national consensus, putting defense above other political considerations within the government and within the parliament, the Knesset. But the situation in Israel is such that Israel could very wind up, very well wind up with the fourth election and a breakdown of the coalition by November. This on top of the complications that Mr. Netanyahu is facing in the three indictments coming to trial, ah, that, that, that he is the defendant. This situation could not be more complicated. It could not be more precarious and it could not be more potentially dangerous. But again, we see it coming to a head once more this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Israelis determined that it was Iran who, who designed and orchestrated an attempted bomb attack on the Golan Heights. <clears throat> the four terrorists who were Iranian trained and equipped and funded were shot dead by the IDF, by the Israeli military. But it was not an attack that came from Hezbollah. It was not an attack that came from ISIS. It was not an attack that came from Al-Qaeda. It was an attack that came from Iranian sponsorship this week in prophecy. There are unreported strikes by the Israeli Air Force on Iranian targets, both in Syria and probably, to a degree, in Iraq, uh, although the Iraqi ones cannot be confirmed. Nonetheless, we see the tensions building up once more. As we reported last week in Prophecy, the government of Assad is very, very weak now and very unstable. The weakness of Iran in the aftermath of the American assassination of General Soleimani and the Israeli attacks on Iranian and Hezbollah targets inside Syria, as well as the fact that the Russians have begun to move away from him in a power play to the point where a Russian-equipped militia south of Damascus is formed. It is basically commanded by a Russian general indirectly, and it is opposed to Assad. Its efforts and its sympathies against Assad are only being curtailed by the degree of Russian control that exists. The real story, though, this week in prophecy, and one that people need to pay attention to, and this is our main feature this week. Please pay attention. What is going on with Turkey? Turkey has a number of internal problems that are eclipsed by the external military adventurism of Turkey. Women's rights, the abuse of women, protests by women, protests by secularists against the Islamist government of Recep Erdogan, and increased economic problems are all plaguing Turkey. Turkey still has some kind of ambition of getting into the European Union, which the Greeks are almost certain never to acquiesce to or allow with their power of veto. Turkey has been a staging point for the influx of astronomical numbers of refugees, many of them radical Muslims coming from Syria, but also refugees coming from Africa being turned into Greece and Italy. Again, it is a power play by Erdogan. But let's understand what Erdogan is really doing. What we have in Libya 
Is Erdogan supporting the UN-backed government with Russia against its opponents, the Khalifa uh, Khan, which is backed by Egypt? Why does Turkey have an interest in Libya? It is not simply Libyan oil. It goes beyond that. Turkish military is involved in a very supportive role in the fighting around Sirta in Libya, but Turkey has been bringing radical Islamists, radical Islamists, people who others would consider to be terrorists, they've been bringing them into Libya. Now remember, after Turkey, Libya is the second biggest staging point for the infiltration and influx of radical Muslims and infiltration by radical Muslim terrorists into Europe. And Turkey is playing its hand, directing the traffic, bringing these people actually in. Turkey is making Libya the staging point. An actual fact has always been the staging point, but under the influence of Turkey, it's been expanded. What are the reasons for this? Well, Turkey is in a conflict with Egypt, which we'll explain in a moment. But as we've reported on This Week in Prophecy some months ago, Turkey and Libya are trying to form a coalition that will counter the coalition that has emerged between Israel and Greece but also involving Cyprus and Egypt for the Leviathan oil fields and for the natural gas deposits in the Levantin and the Eastern Mediterranean, where there's also oil exploration. Turkey is trying to outmaneuver the Israelis, the Egyptians, the Cypriots, and the Greeks, their traditional enemies, and they require Libya to do it. Now, let's go beyond this. There are further reasons for the conflict. Turkey has made major inroads diplomatically and economically into Somalia and into Mogadishu, major ones. Um, but now it has arrived in Yemen. Now, they've arrived in Yemen in opposition to the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Why are they doing this? They're somehow not cooperating with Iran, but certainly playing Iran's game to a degree. What are they trying to do in Yemen? What are they trying to do in the Horn of Africa? They are trying to resurrect the old Ottoman Empire. That is Erdogan's dream, vision, to be a Mahdi-type figure. Remember, the Turks, although Muslims, at one time in history, they actually destroyed the Kaaba in Mecca. And although Muslims, they subjugated the Arabs into a serf class and even a slave class. This is the background to the book and the film of Lawrence of Arabia during the Allenby campaigns in the First World War, where the British organized Arabs to fight the Turks who were aligned with the Kaiser's Germany. These Turkish ambitions, this Turkish militarism, this Turkish subjugation of Arab nations is the history of of the Ottoman Empire, and something that Erdogan wants to see revived. He's in Yemen. He's in the Horn of Africa. He is now diplomatically in bed with Qatar, who is facing a blockade from Saudi Arabia that Turkey has again broken, and, of course, Libya. He's playing his hand in the Arab world and in the Horn Africa, essentially looking to surround Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates. 
Why is he opposing the Emirates? Why is he opposing Egypt? Why is he opposing Saudi Arabia? This is what the Ottoman Empire did. They sought to subject the Arab Muslims to make themselves the leaders of the Islamic world. Erdogan believes that is his heritage. Now, please listen carefully. We've been warning about Erdogan for some time. We are not stating that he is the Antichrist. He's not the Antichrist. But he is certainly a Antichrist. First of all, because of the region he comes from. We have Bible studies and other uh, teachings dealing with this subject. The region, the nation he comes from. But also, as we teach in our book, Shadows of the Beast, the Antichrist will attempt and succeed to convince the Westerners he's a Westerner, to convince the Muslims he's a Muslim, and even to convince the Jews he's a Jew. He's somebody who will multi-identify, multi-identify. Erdogan attempts to identify strongly as a Muslim, but he also has a Turkey that is a member of NATO and that has ambitions of becoming a member of the European Union, despite the unlikelihood of that happening <clears throat> any time in the foreseeable future. He's a NATO member, officially at least on paper, aligned with the United States, Great Britain, and the countries of NATO. Now again, the insular air base is operational, but only semi-operational. Cooperation with NATO has been damaged. The Americans refused to sell the F-35 to the Turks in response to the Turkish purchase of the Russian S-400 anti-aircraft system. These are the things that are happening. Turkey is like Qatar on steroids. It has no friends. It has no allies. It only has relationships and alliances of convenience to advance its own ends. His lot has not been all successful, however. When the Muslim Brotherhood fell from power in Egypt with the collapse of the Morsi regime, saved by General Assisi, Turkey lost its foothold in Egypt, the most populous of the Arab countries. This was a big problem to him. The Nubian population of the upper Egypt or the south of Egypt gave him a foothold culturally and politically into black Africa. There's also, of course, the Coptic Church who represent about 9% of the population and are persecuted and oppressed inside of Egypt. But Erdogan has a situation where he was outflanked by Morsi, supported by the West in Egypt. It is notable that the Obama administration supported the Muslim Brotherhood. The Obama administration, in effect, supported a radical terrorist Muslim regime coming to power in Egypt and objected to his being deposed by General Assisi. This was carried out by Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and uh, Valerie Jared. This was the Obama administration. The betrayals of American interests by Barack Obama are almost incalculable. Fortunately, General Sisi came to power. As a result, the Muslim Brotherhood lost its political control of Egypt. Now remember, the same Muslim Brotherhood are the ones who control in Gaza Hamas, and they're the same ones responsible for the assassination of Anwar Sadat. But that's who Barack Obama wanted. Barack Obama, the friend of radical Islam, did not get his way. The Muslim Brotherhood were again pushed out of power when Morsi's government fell. But this has caused resentment 
and increased opposition against Egypt, particularly against the regime of General Morsi by the Turkish regime of Recep Erdogan. Erdogan. Also, they lost their bid in the Horn of Africa. They have attempted to make power plays in the Horn of Africa with some success in Somalia and Mogadishu. They also tried to get strategic control of uh, Sioxia Island. Uh, this island, I'll say Sioxia Island, is just opposite Saudi Arabia at the southern access of the Red Sea. It would be a strategically crucial location for someone looking to encircle Saudi Arabia. He has since, of course, gotten a footprint in Qatar and a military footprint in Yemen. But he lost out in the Horn of Africa, and he lost out in Egypt, and he is angry concerning it. Now, why do I point these things out? Again, the Antichrist will be in the character of Herod the Great. He'll cover multiple bases in terms of his identity. Herod the Great was not a great guy. He was a terrible guy, but a great builder. He impressed Rome. The Romans considered him to be a Roman, a European. The Jews considered him to be a Jew, king of the Jews, even though he was an Arab. He was an Idumean ethnically. Well, Erdogan is the same. He's trying to identify along multiple lines, certainly as a Muslim, but certainly as a Westerner, NATO member at the same time, controlling the Bosporus Straits where the Black Sea and the Mediterranean conjoin, controlling the Dardanelles. This is Erdogan. He has a strategically important position by mere virtue of geography, and he knows how to play his hand. He is definitely trying to resurrect, definitely has an ambition, what he probably delusionally believes to be a uh, mandate from Allah to resurrect the old Ottoman Empire and to take functional control of much, if not most, of the Arab world and the Muslim world generally. This is what he's doing. Now, what is very interesting is this. In the book of Daniel, chapters 7 and 8, we read that the little horn, the Antichrist, will put down three kings. We know from early church history, from patristic history, very early pre-Nicene history, that the early Christians said the Apostle John identified the three kings who will be put down by the Antichrist as Libya, Egypt, and the Horn of Africa. To them, it was all Cush, Somalia, Ethiopia. Was, that was all the same to them at that time. Uh, I'm not saying Erdogan is it. I'm not saying it's him. But I am saying, although he may not be the Antichrist, he is certainly an Antichrist, and his political ambitions are exactly in harmony with what the Antichrist is going to do. At some future point, we ought not be surprised if someone comes along and succeeds where Erdogan fails and achieves that ambition. Enough said. Uh, there are two beasts in Revelation, both Antichrists, I'm not going to go any further. There's a very complex subject. Erdogan, however, has the spirit of Antichrist. He is an Antichrist, and his political and his religious actions, uh, as well as his economic activity, of course, which is part of his politics and strategic policy, but his, both of his, his military and his political policies are very much in accord with what Daniel 7 and 8 tells us about the Antichrist. 
No, I am not saying it's him, but the Antichrist will be like him. And he is in Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa, and Egypt, pursuing the agenda of the Antichrist. Watch this man, and watch this agenda for the future. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless, and thank you so much for listening to This Week in Prophecy, Morial Ministries, and RTN, Remnant Truth Network, TV and radio. Thank you. about Moriel, check out our website www.moriel.org